In this video we're going to look at Tugar backgrounds and the idea of a Tugar background is that you are able to model shapes within the background that are not associated with zero loss photo emission processes but are associated with electrons that have undergone some type of energy loss as a consequence of moving through the solid state after the atom generating the electron has been ionized. So we have electrons of a given kinetic energy that are characteristic of these photo emission peaks and then subsequently some type of interaction with the atoms within the solid produce shapes such as this one here. And This sample is an aluminium foil that has been sputter cleaned to produce a, a metallic surface. You can see here an argon peak that represents the argon that has been embedded in the sample as a consequence of the sputtering and these peaks that we see either side of the two photo emission peaks are background peaks. So these are the type of signal that a Tugar background should be able to model. XPS data is generated by ionizing atoms within a solid state. And when we ionize an atom within a solid state the atom is at varying depths within the material and when ionized the electron emerges with a characteristic energy and the characteristic energy is related to the photon energy the bound state of the atom and the bound state of the ion that is generated by the excitation by the photon if there were no other atoms around the atom that was ionized then an electron would emerge with the characteristic energy and all electrons would be measured with the same energy. But because we're in a solid state, when the electron emerges from an atom, there is a probability that that electron will interact with other electrons within other atoms and excite the electronic configurations of these other atoms. And as a consequence of the excitation, energy is lost to the electron that was originally emitted from an atom. So despite having originated with a given energy, when recorded after scattering, the energy for the electron means that signal appears as part of this background. And in the case of aluminium, there are certain resonances that can occur that produce sharp shapes in the background signal. And it's these types of shapes that the Tugar background is attempting to model and by doing so we ought to be able to work out the type of shape that corresponds to the background beneath these photo emission peaks that are associated with inelastic scattering and that gives us a better chance of estimating the amount of signal in a systematic way that we can then apply quantification to to work out the amount of substance for aluminium or even work out different chemical state in terms of peak models that will include such a background. A background can be added to data using the quantification parameters dialog window on the regions property page. If we press the create button then in this case we have a linear background and you can clearly see that the linear background cuts through data and over this type of energy range it's not appropriate to use a linear background. So let's try a Shirley background. And if we add a Shirley background, well, it looks like it makes some kind of sense here around the photo emission peak. And over this type of range, it's because this is a relatively flat response of the instrument and a flat rise in the background, we have a Shirley background that is even doing a reasonable job in terms of identifying the peak for this aluminium 2P. But you can also see that these resonance structures that are part of the background will not be described by a Shirley background whatsoever. So this is the first indication that the Shirley background really is quite a, a coarse background approximation compared to what we would expect to find for a Tugar background. One of the differences between the Shirley background and the Tugar background is simplicity of the Shirley background. It's an algorithm that is very straightforward. It relies on iteration, calculating the background based on area above the background, and it has to be iterated to converge to a background that it actually is very characteristic of the shape you might expect for an error function.
The only difference being, rather than using a Gaussian for an error function, you have the line shape itself that is integrated to produce this Shirley step here. In terms of a two-gar background, we have cross-section terms that have to be defined. So rather than simply entering a name such as Shirley and obtaining a background, what we have to do is specify the type of two-gar background we would like to use. So here I've got a UAL two-gar background and this will update the cross-section field with parameters that were defined by Tugar and published. So I'm going to press return and you can see here that the cross-section fields have all changed. Now I'm going to adjust this away from the fixed Tugar AL and I'm going to make this a U4 Tugar parameter which is actually using all four of these parameters in the cross-section, that's the number four and when I press return here then the shape of the background reflects the values that are here in the cross-section. The U3 Tugar background which is another equivalent form of this U4 Tugar background it uses only three of these parameters that are specified. The first parameter is calculated and the first parameter was calculated in the AL background also. This first parameter represents a scaling of the Tugar cross-section. So we can increase or decrease the contribution of the Tugar cross-section terms, that's these three, by making adjustments to this B parameter. So what I'll do first of all is I'll assign a value of 16 here, indicating that I want less of an influence of this specific cross-section on the background itself. And when I press return, you can see now that the background has lowered beneath the spectra for the most part. The other parameters, this is the C parameter, represents a term that will allow us to shift the cross-section and the sharpness of the cross-section is determined by the D parameter and this is a very small number as Tugar cross-sections go and this is responsible for this resonance type shape in the background. So if I use these two parameters, I can move the resonance peak. So if we look at this position here, when I press return on adding 5 to the current value, you can see that the resonance now moves and it is matching more the peak in this resonance structure. Now I could also change the sharpness of this resonance structure. So if I set the D value to 4.1 instead of 4.5, we should find that the peak maximum increases, and so it does. So the objective is to make adjustments to cross-section parameters that are consistent with the data that we have here. So we can see that the resonance that corresponds to this particular Tugar background is reproducing the shapes that we see in the background, if not completely reproducing the background everywhere, we can at least see that this cross-section here produces a resonance shape when the Tugar algorithm is applied with this cross-section. It's clear that this background doesn't fit the data perfectly and the reason for this is that these represent resonances in delocalized electrons associated with aluminium and this peak here is characteristic of a bulk plasmon whereas we have another shape here that is characteristic of a surface plasmon that's to say the background shape depends on from where in the sample the electrons are being scattered so closer to the surface we have an interface that causes a change in the frequency of how these electrons are scattered by these delocalized electrons from the metallic aluminium so what we need to do is introduce another term in this Tugar background approximation that represents the surface plasmon while retaining the same shape that we have for the bulk plasmon. So what we'll do is having selected the region, we'll copy it and paste. And so now I have two backgrounds that are defined over the same interval and one is a U4 Tugar background, and that's the first one representing the bulk plasmons. 
and if I change the background type from U4 to U plus Tugar and press return then what happens is we double up on the bulk plasmon and hence the background leaps away from the data. However the bulk plasmon and the surface plasmon have different positions and these can be changed by altering one relative to the other. So if I make this 110 for example, this is the C parameter and this determines for the most part the position of the resonance. So when I press return we can now see that as a consequence of having two Tugar calculations based on these data we now have one representing the bulk plasmon and the other the surface but we can also see that the surface plasmon is a much broader feature so I'm going to change this and make this say 35 and this is the D parameter and this determines the width of the cross section and when I enter 35 here you can now see that the shape of the background is starting to mirror the shape of the data itself and what I need to do now is reduce the contribution of the plasmon so that I end up with a shape that is hugging the data more closely and that's a little bit too low so let me add a bit more and as a result I can build up the different influences that we have on these data producing this cross-section. Now I haven't produced the ultimate Tugar cross-section based on the bulk and the surface plasmon but even as this stands you can see that the resonance structures can be modeled using this Tugar formalism where you can construct a background that increasingly looks like the background associated with these data. Up to this point the background has been constructed by adjusting these parameters in the cross sections and you might believe that these can be adjusted arbitrarily but in fact they cannot. The surface plasmon and the bulk plasmon have been studied and the position for these plasmon resonances and the width of the plasmons has been predicted. So these cannot be chosen arbitrarily and we can illustrate this by making adjustments to this cross-section for the surface plasmon. If I change the D parameter from 35 to 15 and then make a corresponding adjustment in the B parameter that alters the proportion of the surface plasmon in this particular shape, you can reproduce the data almost as well as you did previously. So these physical parameters in terms of the width of a of a resonance structure are not arbitrary and they are not unique if you simply adjust these parameters. So in terms of science and the science of this background such an exercise is of limited value. In terms of understanding how photoemission and inelastic scattering contribute to a background signal there is some merit in observing how these parameters and a peak interact to produce a background. And in particular, it begs the question about the Shirley background. If you consider what would happen in this zone here, if you put a Shirley background on, then you would end up with a step in the background. Let's just illustrate that by taking a copy. Now copy again without the two gar background. So I've now got one without and one with. And if I introduce here a Shirley background and place the Shirley background across the aluminium 2P and then overlay these, we can see the difference between the Shirley background and the two gar background. So here is the Shirley background, here is the Tugar background. If we accept the behavior of the Shirley background, when we consider this in the context of the Tugar formalism, what a Shirley background would imply is that there is some kind of loss cross-section that needs to be applied to these data 
that would then produce a shape beneath the photoemission peak itself. If we now look at another background that is calculated for the same data, this represents a background that is now constructed from not two representing the bulk on the surface, but also some other cross-section here. I'm not quite sure whether this is physically meaningful as a cross-section, but nevertheless it serves to illustrate what would be required to produce a Shirley type shape beneath the photoemission peak for the aluminium 2P. It also has a consequence of allowing a shape to be fitted over here corresponding to signal that's associated with the first plasmon for the bulk. So this shape here is not just isolated to the photoemission peak beneath the aluminium 2P. And I can illustrate that if I step down this list of data and these are copies of the same aluminium data that if I step down the first one is a calculation where only the bulk plasmon has a non-zero B value. So these other two cross sections are not contributing to the background that you see here. So this is just the bulk plasmon. If I go down again, this is the surface plasmon, the B value in the bulk and the additional cross section is set to zero. And then this is the shape that is producing the Shirley-like structure beneath the aluminium 2P. And it also has a consequence of the shape over here that is an important part of fitting these data with the full background as calculated. So if I go up, you can now see that all three are required to fit the data with this background. 